Shall we pray? Father Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for this new day to which you have brought us in safety. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I had written here to say something that we're all thinking about right now, and uh, that's the hurricane hit on all of us. And we want to <coughs> remember them in our hearts and in our minds. Um, the, the topic I was given was the Bible and serious literature. And uh, I unwisely jumped in and said, oh, I think I can do that. And <laughs> it's turned out to be quite a subject. Uh, and I hope we'll have a, a, a lot of discussion. Um, we've got two serious <coughs> Offers that we will be considering today. Part of this because they go with a subject that I think is really important to us in our church, and that is uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, who I always knew very little about, and I'll tell you why in a minute, and, and William Faulkner, about whom I know a good deal because I've been a fan of his uh, for a long time and he's one of the most cantankerous, he's one of the most cantankerous authors probably in world history. Uh, but very, very good. So I, I hope we, we can get something out of this. If you know uh, William Faulkner uh, won the Nobel Prize for Literature <coughs> in 1950 after all the books were out of print and nobody was even reading them. You know. And when he got the Nobel Prize, all of a sudden he was a superstar and all the books were back on the shelf. And they've been back on the, back on the shelf ever since. So that's the way it is. Literary life's like all other life. But he, he, was, he was finished when, when he got that, 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 that Nobel that Prize. And of course, uh, Hawthorne uh, is always been well known in American uh, literature. Uh, he too was not a very successful writer at all. He was a very serious writer, a highly regarded man, a well educated uh, man. He was a Puritan. And he was having some difficulties with that, and, and that shows up in, in some of his literature. But uh, both Faulkner and Hawthorne, and by the way, Faulkner really respected Hawthorne. Uh, uh, both, both of them wrote on some subjects that is a very important part of our worship service. And that is, they wrote about the connection between the heart and the mind. Now what does that bring into your mind? What's the connection between the heart and the mind? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> What, what, somebody was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Who was that? <laughs> Jesus was asked that question, and let me give you his answer, and it's, it's in the prayer book. It, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which is called the Summary of the Law. And when we changed the prayer book, 
That's one of the few direct Bible passages that's in our catechism. The outline of the faith. And it's, it's, it's very, very good. Let me get the page number here. Uh, 851 in the uh, prayer book. It should be if we have the same one. Do y'all ever read this, go back to the catechism <clears throat> very much? I mean, I do it all the time. I, in a new prayer book, I think this is one of the real glories. This is the clearest statement of our faith. Uh, in, in the in the uh, Episcopal Church that I have ever seen, it answers every time I have a question about something. I go to this catechism first. It, it is so tremendously, it is so tremendously good. Now let me find it here. <clears throat> Jesus was with a bunch of uh, Pharisees, and again this this. Very same thing is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. <clears throat> and he was asked, What is the greatest commandment? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment and the second is like unto us that's the last one yes. yes. shall love thy neighbor and thyself and then he said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets meaning this sums that this is everything you need to know about the ten commandments you don't need to go in because they're kind of hard to wade through sometimes when you, it says things like you shall do no murder that means well you can kill any other way I guess as long as it's not murder <laughs> you can shoot the guy and if he doesn't die you're okay um, but th this this summed up the, the uh, 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 Ten Commandments and then he it also says, and that didn't happen here, but, but the uh, uh, catechism tells us, uh, the, new, the new commandment he gave us, what is, it, uh, this always asks, gives you the question, what is the new commandment? That's another thing I like about this uh, outline of the faith and the catechism. It always has a question and then gives you an answer. So, is what's the new commandment? The new commandment is that we love one another as Christ loved us. So this this was not in the uh, other prayer book, and I, I think it's really important that it was in here. And this is one of the few direct Bible verses saying of Jesus that is actually printed in. Our catechism, which shows how important that is considered now, it's been given a much more prominent place than, than, <clears throat> than, it, than it once had. So let's look at that just a minute. There's there's some kind of some modifier in Jesus Jesus's words that <clears throat> can give us some pause. When he, what did he put first? Your heart. With how much of your heart? All of, All of your heart. Then he said, your soul. All of your soul. And then the other part on the end that is so important, your mind and all of your mind. 
So if you're going to obey these commandments, that's what you have to do. Well, are we going to be able to do that? No. But should we always be trying if that is our guide? Yes. And if we know that we don't do that, what's the next thing we need to do that we do in our service every Sunday? We confess. Now, the, the new confession that we have that we're using now uh, is not, you know, those of us who grew up on the older confession, I should say right one <coughs> instead of older, because they're still in the prayer book and should be. Uh, <coughs> They did not really directly address these important words of Jesus with the, 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 the two commandments. You, you don't see the word heart used in them. Uh, and, and we are really lowly, even though we love this. I remember when I first went off to college, uh, to Swanee, never been in an Episcopal church. There wasn't one in our county. I grew up in a Baptist church, and I'm not complaining about it. Uh, I liked it. Uh, it, it, was, it was a good church, but I also felt that I, if I had not gone to Swanee, I probably would never have gone to church again, frankly. Because uh, that's what happened to all my friends who went to UK. <laughs> you know, I you still go to church? And, and, but it's why you had to go to church. They don't have this anymore, but I wish they did. You had to go to morning prayer. I think it's something like 3.7 times a week. <laughs> Uh, and and you, if you didn't, and you had to sign a little slip that said that you went to that service, and they kept a tabulation on it at the university, and it was saying, "Oh my honor!" And you got up in a really serious ceremony and signed your name on the honor code book. And you would never lie and cheat or steal, so nobody cheated on those slips. So we had to we had to go and 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 then we had to go seven Sundays a semester. And if you didn't do that, you didn't graduate. Uh, unless you could get really get somewhere really fast and take a whole bunch of things. People the the, the uh, chapel was packed with students. On Sundays, as it was getting near the end of the semester. <laughs> but there I learned the, the uh, so, you know, the first one was that we said it morning prayer. Um, let, let, me, let me think of that just a minute because I know it. Uh, like, like long sheep, we have. Aired and stretched. Aired and stretched. What did we do? We aired and stretched. We aired and stretched. We aired and stretched. I know that. Anybody know it? Because we don't say it much anymore. Gone stretched. And then we. Gone stretched. Yeah, yeah, gone stretched. Black cloth sheep. We have black cloth sheep. We have gone stretched. Aired and gone stretched. Funny thing about that. I said air, and some Episcopalian students who become great friends of mine took me to church. They said, oh, it's not hard. I said, I've never been there. He said, it's real easy. <laughs> and at the end, I said air, and they said, uh, John, it's bird. <laughs> so, so they said, yeah, it, it is preferred that you say her. <laughs> a little memory, a little memory aid there. So then I always knew it was her, and, and I hear other educated people say her, 
But now it's changed. It's air. Everybody, nobody says er anymore. They look at you as if you're crazy if you say er now. Um, and, and then the other one was the one that we have uh, here. Uh, we acknowledge and you know, well, our manifold sins and wickedness, which we most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed, and memory, and behold, it is. We were just down there. <laughs> and, and, but I love it. And, and when I've lost everything up here, those are the two that I, I'll be saying. But it's the Tony Bennett effect. If, if you do these things all your life, you're going to be saying them or singing them even though you don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> but uh, we love both of those and they think that uh, that the one I was the, the second one there uh, we acknowledge and be well. Uh, when I was at Swanee, I look at See, I've never seen this before. And I, when I go to church on Sunday, a lot of alumni would be there. They would come in. And, uh, the, these, these were people who were very well off. They were very nice. All ladies and gentlemen. But when I stepped in and heard, I had never heard that in a, in a church before that we had, oh, we had, done this, we have done that, we're so awful, memory of them is, and it's, it's just, we've been terrible. And I said, you know, that is really impressive that people like that get down on their knees every Sunday and say that, because I just had never heard that. We had a happier thing in the Baptist church, except at revival time. <laughs> but we, that's just the way that was just the way it, 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 it was done there and you wouldn't see major confessions by major people in the community um, at, at revival time but to do that every week and I just thought well how appropriate that I'll be rich people <laughs> saying that they know that money's not everything and they, they, they've got a lot to, to confess so that, that made that made a, a, a real impression on me. And so when we came up with the uh, uh, new uh, confession that we say now, it, it didn't quite have all that. It doesn't quite have all those ringing tones, but I really love it now because it, it says, we have not loved you with our whole heart. In other words, we are confessing we did not obey the number one thing you said in, in your commandment. And then the other thing it says, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. The other thing that was just like it according to Jesus. So we are covering the summary of the law now in our confession in a way that we really didn't used to do. It was in there, and it was even in the prayer book, but it was not something said every Sunday. It would just be said at, at, at certain times. So that, that was something I really noticed about the uh, right one uh, confession that it is right with the great commandment that, that Jesus uh, gave, gave us. Anybody got anything you'd like to say on that? You can kill some time here. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I do think that, that, you know, it's really hard to love thy neighbor as thyself. I mean, we've moved a lot, and I still have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I have a lot of trouble about who is my neighbor, because the example Jesus gave was somebody that his whole race hated. 
even though they were offered, even that, that they and he have was offered rice, they had broken up. And um, but that that's basically a means love your enemies too, or your neighbors. And that, that's that's a, a that's a hard one to swallow too. John. Uh -huh. Um, I learned from a very wise Episcopal counselor that we could love someone even if we didn't like anything they were choosing to do. And that really helped me to separate because my needs aren't always honorable. So why would I expect my neighbor's needs to always be honorable if they're still a child of God? That's a very, very good point. And th that doesn't mean when you're loving somebody, you're agreeing with everything they are, are saying or doing at any given time, and that that is that is important because you you, you can think of things that uh, you, you have done or I can at least, and and I wouldn't want to be just written out a book <laughs> because of, because of that. Anybody else? Are politicians your neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> but 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 it, it, it it's got to be done. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I've got to really work on Putin. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm certainly trying not to hate the Russian people because they are in, they are in bad straits over there uh, with that guy. And, and of course, there's conscientious objection. We've always had that. You know, you don't have to hate, if you're in a war, you don't have to hate somebody to kill them intentionally because that that person is trying to kill you intentionally, and, and you don't necessarily have to hate that person. You just have to be able to try to stop him from doing what, he, what he's uh, uh, trying to do. Um, there, there are other things that, that come up in combat like that. You remember going back to, to, to the Civil War and, and certainly coming forward. When one side or the other found a soldier that a southern soldier or a Union soldier seriously wounded. They didn't just let live and let it die. They, they took them in to, for, for medical care in many instances of that. The same thing happened in the uh, uh, Korean War at time. You might be shooting at these people, but then after the battle's over, you just say, one out there dying and needs medical help, that's that's when you that's when the love aspect uh, comes up. I think what what do you all think about that? That makes sense. Or John, not? I think if love is too hard a thing to come by sometimes, you could at least start with respect. You know, if you respect your fellow man, it gives you a way to see them as a human being and to See how God loves us all, regardless of what we are. The disappointment we are. <laughs> okay, let me see here. Where we go? I'm to say one thing before I forget it. I, I know it's coming to some of these other sessions. Uh, that uh, these teachers who are really good, uh, their students from Lee <coughs> will be here. <laughs> and so they get, get these great crowds. Well, I so, sort of feel that way today because there are quite a few folks from our old Sunday school class here. And uh, uh, some teachers, uh, Kurt did some did some teaching. What other teacher have I there? Of course, Jeff Sellers was a, a, a kind of a point that he Jeff can't be here. Um, and I see really regular students here that came to that class. Martha and Bob, I always can see sitting right <laughs> in my right. <laughs> and that, that, that means a lot, doesn't it? 
that were, that were good, good clients. And I do hope everybody keeps up with all of these things that are being offered now because uh, Isaac and Joel have worked really hard on these sessions. And I have, haven't you all really enjoyed what you've seen so far and found it very, very good? I, I have. Uh, but I wanted to mention that. Now let's let's get into these these two guys. Um, we'll start with uh, Hawthorne and his uh, story, short story, Ethan Brand. Has anybody read that besides Pat, Patricia? What? That's because it was a great book. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else read that story? Ethan Brand by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I hadn't read it. And in fact, I, uh, I have a lot of trouble with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, when I was a child, my dad was called back in the service. We were, he was stationed outside of Massachusetts. And they told me one day we were going over to Salem. To, to uh, visit the house of the seven gables, which I've never heard of. But if you know that, that's one of the books your parents had read. My mother wanted to go. And so we go over there. Uh, out there. It was a gloomy house. And it, it had a hidden staircase. I was in the third grade here. It had a, it had a hidden staircase. That scared me. <laughs> it was really close in and it was dark, and I was hanging on to somebody else coming down that staircase, and I thought, oh, that was, it was one of the scariest things I'd ever done. I just, I, I guess I'm a little claustrophobic, but I've never noticed that. Well, then we go, we're getting ready to move to Upper New York State, and my grandmother comes up for a visit. She had never been up nowhere. And uh, we asked her where she would like to go around Boston. And she said, oh, I'd love to go see the house of the seven days. <laughs> <laughs> so back I go again. And this time I can remember hanging on my grandmother's dress. <laughs> we, the first time I came down, this time we were going up. And I said, boy, if I get through this, I'm never coming back to this house again. <laughs> and I never did, but I tried to read the book, but I couldn't get into it. Has anybody read the house of the seven gables? Seriously? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> did you like it? Yeah, it's been a while. It's, yeah, it's been a while, but it's kind of, you're right, but it's hard to get into it. Yeah, I was too young. I, I was too young. And, and, uh, and then, then of course, you know, Hawthorne really struggled as a writer. He, he wrote a lot of really great short stories before it was really popular to write short stories, call them romances. And, but they didn't sell. And Ethan Brand was one of the last ones he wrote before he became famous because the, the theme in Ethan Brand, which is right out of the, the uh, commandment, the first commandment that Jesus gave, uh, really after he, he became, he, he, his next book, it got him into the Scarlet Letter. And it was because there were certain things he was really bothered by in the um, Puritan sect of the English church. Um, was, um, first of all, they, he had family members who had been judges in the witch trials. But he was from a very prominent family. Hawthorne family had been around a long time. 
And some of his ancestors had, had been people who were punishing women and witches. That that bothered him tremendously. He couldn't reconcile that. Uh, the, the other thing that that bothered him was the, the Puritan Church was into the concept of you can have perfection on earth. You can obey the commandments. You can be perfect. You can't be pure. You don't have to confess. He doubted that was the correct uh, approach. But there have been strong movements in this country, as you know, that we can be a perfect society. We even say a more perfect union. Well, that is not a Christian belief that there can be perfection on earth. The Christian belief is that we try to do what we're asked to do as best we can and ask forgiveness when we fail. And then there is beyond this world a perfect place. That, that is the, the, the Orthodox view. And but it's had to, it's amazes me how many times we have slipped into this uh, perfectionism. And it even happens in a secular way, too. Like Hitler promised his people he was going to create a perfect Germany. They were going to have a perfect, they were getting rid of all the views, and then Germany would be perfect. And you can justify a lot of crimes by getting people to, to believe. Uh, some, something like, uh, like like that. And the, the other thing I want to say there, and this is even closer to uh, Ethan Brown's uh, story, is that the Puritans believe that there could be ways to discover evil in other words, they weren't just against evil, they were for examining people looking for evil in their hearts. That's part of the witch problem, that was, that was, that was, that was part of that. So he had, real, he had real trouble with that concept, even though he, he was a dedicated Puritan, and he had to be very careful about what he wrote. And, and what he said, but he did not believe that we should be going around looking for sins in the hearts of our fellow Christians, and, and that's that's what that, that's what they were doing, and that's what uh, Ethan Brand is about. Uh, an, an interesting thing about Ethan Brand, after he had written it, then he did do the Scarlet Feet. <laughs> the uh, uh, scarlet wine. Oh, letter, letter. <laughs> and, and he became incredibly famous. He was the first American writer that was really recognized by real literary people in England. I mean, he all of a sudden was a superstar because of that book. And so it, it, jumped, it, it totally uh, changed his, his life. And he wrote several books after that, The House of the Seven Gables, Kate Hex, <coughs> and then The Marble Farmer, and the book he wrote about being in, in uh, an album he wrote about being in, in Italy. But he all of a sudden was just recognized as a literary genius with this book, with the, the Scarlet Letter. So, but going back, let's go back to Ethan Brand now the story. Um, Ethan Brand was a, uh, what they call a lime burner. That's the person that works at, at uh, Keep the lime kilns where they put 
marble inside these chimney type things and create great heat to disintegrate the marble into fine lime used for agricultural purposes. Big, big, still do this lime business there. But that was a that was a major business uh, at, at, at this time and still is. And these kilns where they burn the marble to to create the uh, lime were manned by people called uh, uh, lime burners. Burn the marble to make wine and. There was this guy named Ethan Brand who had done that for 18 years. And then he just one day out of the blue popped back up. Now the reason he left, and he was considered a real oddball, which he was, when he left was he was going to look to see if he could find the unpardonable sin. He was looking for the unpardonable sin in the hearts of people. But see, that goes back to that problem that was bothering Hawthorne in this business of looking into people's hearts. He left there, was gone 18 years, and during that 18 years, he would make friends with people. And he basically became a psychologist. And he got them to really tell him their feelings so he could decide if they had committed an unpardonable sin. Crazy. I mean, he was obsessed with that with that concept. And so he returns 18 years later, nobody had seen him. And they, they, and the lime burner there then did not know him, but had knew him by reputation. Everybody, as he said, knew Ethan Brand, the crazy guy who left to find the unpardonable sin. And so he returns to them, and they're talking, and and um, boy has a young child with him, and he says, uh, <clears throat> "What did you find in the Bible, sin?" And he said, uh, "Yes, I did." He said, "Really? Where did you find it?" He said, "In my heart. The unpardonable sin is in my heart." And so he said, well, yeah, whatever, this guy is really crazy. <laughs> and so they, they call the people up. He sends his son down to the local bar. This was at night when Ethan showed up. He said, go tell all the bar flies down there that Ethan's brand is back. And then he said, They'll want to come. Up, they'll want to come up here and see him because he was the legend there, the guy that had left to make that to, to make that search. And so the rest of the book is 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 about different encounters he's telling about that he had with people. And he said. I, I, I would examine the hearts of some people, again, we're talking psychological, and discover that they were just plain old everyday sinners like you all are. But then every now and then I find a real, a real, and those are the ones we've got to get rid of, uh, sort of in, 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 in that way. And he made some, let's see if I can find. A, a couple of um, crowds. I mean, I'm going to take too much time. But, but, but he, he admitted in finding the unpardonable sin that he had it, that he had hurt a lot of people and had gained control.
control over them and had made them his puppets. He said, I, I really did an awful thing here. I used these people and I destroyed some of their lives. There was one old man that was there and said his daughter it was missing. And he joined the circus and they said she was a really great performer and blah, blah, blah. And asked if he bring it here for seeing my daughter, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And he didn't answer me, but he said to himself, oh yeah, I remember Esther. Um, I, I had real control over her, and I probably uh, destroyed her, not only her heart, but her soul, and destroyed her. Um, so he knew that what he was doing, he was a, a real thing. He had just turned into a guy taking control over people's minds and then destroying their hearts. And, and he said, I take full responsibility for that. I've done it. And, and he was asked, when are you going to uh, ask for forgiveness? And he said, no, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it again. Which I thought, hmm, I don't know if I'd said that. <laughs> I, I, I was reading that. And he, he did, he, he said some other really, here was his interesting take on mind and heart. But the guy said, you know, when I left here, uh, my mind was definitely weaker than my heart. But while I was out there, I really increased my intellectual capacity. I, I, in effect, got more education. And my mind got stronger than my heart. And so I made all my decisions with my mind, not with my heart. And that's very much a part of, of the concept that the idea is on heart and mind, they stay counterpoised. That's what you're shooting for in your life, is to keep your heart and your mind counterpoised. Because if your heart ever gets greater than your mind, your intellectual capacity gets greater than your, your heart, then you're in real trouble. That, and that was the, the, the theme of this book. And that had happened. That had happened to him. So they, they kind of left him. He, he told them a, a few other things. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful story to read, but my telling it is not nearly as good as it is to read. It is so well written, but I'd rather just have to sit here and read the whole story. It's not a real long story, maybe 30 pages or something, but you might want to read it. And so he, he decided then that um, he was going to stay there. He says, I'm back here now. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And there was a, a, a kiln that was burning really, really hot. And um, it had a few more hours to burn. And as I said, we'll have all beautiful white wine. Well, when we got up in the morning, uh, they looked in. And there was white lime, but there was also a white lime skeleton in there. And that was the skeleton of Ethan Grant. And then in the middle of the skeleton was a perfect heart. It wasn't drawn out as a heart, it was his heart. Because he had mentioned my heart had hardened like marble. And it, and it 
is just like the marble. And <clears throat> that's the end of the story. Uh, no, no comment after that. And when I first read that, I thought, well, you know, the fact that that heart is there like that, maybe an indication that he asked for and received forgiveness. But then I went back and checked and remembered that he said, I would do it again. And I said, well, I don't know if there's any help for him there. So, so I, I, I I think he even ended up as lying. I mean, that was it. <laughs> that was it for his thing. What do y'all think about that story? Did I make sense of them? I mean, did I get it? I say even from sometimes. <laughs> well, what, what, was, what use of that information, what use is it to us today? Clearly, his mind overtook his heart. His heart, his mind was making all the decisions from his heart. So, John, in my work as a coach, I often have people who can't connect to anything but their mind. And so I literally will have them put a hand on their head and a hand on their heart, and it gives them an energy connection between the two. So that when they're setting goals or making decisions, they can actually let the two work together. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I think we see that sometimes in these athletic events on television too. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a lot of heart <laughs> goes into a, a successful performance. Um, John, I look at I, I look at. Heart as emotion and the mind is logic. And we make a lot of emotional decisions and then we justify them with logic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or try to. Or try to. Well, in our own mind, it's logical. <laughs> That's right. We make it. Well, you know, we use the word heart in so many different ways. I, you know, You've got a stout heart. Um, uh, if, you, if you say somebody has a, a, a stout heart or a lion heart, Richard the lion hearted, is, is used to show courage. Uh, it, it is about your deepest emotion. There's no doubt about that. I, well, I mean, the mind is not, the, the mind is not about emotion. It's, it is supposed to be rational. It's only good when it's being rational. Uh, do you agree with that? That doesn't mean it's being rational makes it good, but that's the way the mind reaches decisions. And a lot of times that is what's best for me. When you're working with your heart, you you don't necessarily think what's best for me. You may think what's best for the team, what's best for the church, what's best for my neighbors. Uh, your mind puts more thought into it. I think one of the things to realize though, because we started talking about Putin, um, our minds are programmable and what we program with, whether it's TV or topics like this or church or the neighbors or whatever it is, whatever our mind is programmed with, that's going to seem rational if we never challenge it. And so I think the important thing is to make sure we're challenging, number one, where does that input come from? Is it TV? What am I watching? Um, is it church? Is it state? That sort of thing. But then also to question are there other sources that would help me balance that out? Because it is programming. That's why they call it TV programming. And then the program of the mind can actually affect the feelings of the heart because our thoughts do create emotions. So there's a, there's a lot to that mind-heart connection and in external environments, which I will be speaking to um, when I present at the end of the season. 
I've never thought of it quite this way, but I, I think coming in here, uh, our heart probably is dominant. Uh, you know, we talk about the commandments and how we treat our neighbor. And we walk out the door and get to the real world. And I, if we're not careful, our mind takes over and it gets complicated. John Zig Ziglar always said, the mind and the heart is the 12 inch mile. 12 inch mile. Mile. I'm going to come back to that just very suddenly in a minute. We, I, we, I'm going to get under one other thing here. Uh, in that regard, uh, about Faulkner, um, let me get his book here. Uh, as I said, Faulkner was a, an interesting character in that he was nowhere until he got the Nobel Peace Prize. And then, I mean, he was everybody's uh, star. And, and, and should have been because a lot of people got to know his work. I, I'm one of them. I, I, I am a really big Faulkner fan. He was a Christian, but he was a difficult Christian. I think he might have been a little like my grandmother, a devoted Christian, but she never went to her church, <laughs> which was named after her family. <laughs> but Methodist Church, not Baptist here. But she, she was devoted. And she was not happy when a good part of her family moved over to the Episcopal Church. <laughs> but she, 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 was a, she was a pretty good reader, too. But, but Faulkner did this thing at the University of Virginia where the students ask him questions. And, and he gets into this same thing. And you can tell, this is where you tell he and, and uh, Faulkner our uh, friends. Uh, but I, I got to say this so I don't miss saying it. In all of Faulkner's books, here he is writing down in Mississippi, the most beloved character, the least educated, but probably the smartest in this great family. <laughs> and certainly had the greatest harm and was a true believing Christian was their cook, Dilsey. The rest of the family, the rest of the family was falling apart and they fell apart. Only she endured. She is, she is the one of the father's greatest characters is Dilsey, the cook. And he did that with one other black man in, in something. So he, he covered he covered the South real well. And he answered some questions about this. And that made me think of that. But I'm going to go to this question here. These are students asking Faulkner questions. If I get the page here, 27. Student says, Mr. Faulkner, what do you think is man's most important tool? The mind or the heart? Now we've kind of, I think we've discussed that. Uh, here's what Faulkner said. I don't have much confidence in the mind. I think there is where the shoe fits. No confidence. Because the mind lets you down sooner or later, but the heart doesn't. He got that directly from uh, Kevin. 
his knowledge of Hawthorne. Uh, also, he was asked, let's see where the next place was, something specifically about Hawthorne and, and about this. Uh, let me just say, Faulkner did not talk so much as the need for the balance between the heart and mind. He said most great literature is about the heart divided against itself. Which is another way of looking at this because you're going to have trouble with the commandments if your heart becomes divided against itself. He said, you know, the, a, a lot of times there, there's a problem that you have and uh, your, your heart has to make the decision. But if the heart can't make a decision and becomes divided against itself, then you're going to have a problem there. And he said a lot of problems are caused by that. And he said if you read serious literature, you'll see lots of hearts divided against themselves. That makes sense. Or is that just an old man? I mean, Faulkner. <laughs> oh, he was only about 60 when he came in. Let's see if I can get another one that kind of helps on that. What, what book? What, is there a particular story in Faulkner's there that you? Well, let me see if I can just get that a little bit closed in a little bit. This was his uh, address on receiving the Nobel Prize. And, and it, 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 it's, it's very interesting. Um, he said, in our day and time, this was back in 1950, there is only one question. When will I be blown up? Because of this, the young men or woman writing today, he was talking about writers, not readers, today has forgotten the problems of the human heart in conflict with itself, which alone can make good writing, because only that is worth writing anything about, worth the agony and the sweat of writing. He can learn them again. He must teach himself that the basis of all things is to be afraid. The basis of all things, things is to be afraid. Do you agree with that? Think about the Bible. How many times did Jesus say, Fear not, be not afraid, it is I. He said to somebody, are you afraid that you still have no faith? So, he had a, 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 some basis for saying that that is the basis of all things, is to be afraid. Uh, Faulkner in his work wrote, wrote a people who had great courage. And teaching himself that, forget it forever, saving no room in his workshop for anything but the old verities and truths of the heart. The old universal truths lacking which any story is ephemeral and vain. Love and honor and pity and pride and compassion and sacrifice. Until he does so, until he writes of the old truths, he labors under a curse. He writes not of love, but of lust, of defeats in which nobody loses anything of value, of victories without, of victories without hope, and worst of all, without pity or compassion. 
His grace green on no universal bones, leaving no scars. He writes not of the heart, but of the glass. Until he relearns these things, he will write as though he stood among and watched the end of man. I decline to accept the end of man. It is easy enough to say that man is immortal simply because he will endure. Yet when the last dim dawn of doom has claimed and faded from the last worthless rock hanging tideless in the last red and dying sun, that even then there will still be one more sound, that of his puny, inexhaustible voice still talking. I refuse to accept this. I believe that man will not merely endure, he will prevail. He is immortal not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. The poets, the writer's duty, is to write about these things. It is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice which have been the glory of his past. The poet's voice need not merely be the record of man, it can be one of the props, the pillars, to help him endure and prevail. I would like to say, the guy, somebody probably did this for him, but wrote men, men and women writers. But <laughs> 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 this is that day. But that was his, that was his speech at the, when he received the Nobel Prize. Uh, man will, man will survive. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Is it, is that, Christian. We'll survive what? The end of the world. Huh. Yeah, with the last, what do you call it? The last ding dong of the Would that be the right truth? Yeah, it, it would be. I, I, I think it's very good. I find it pretty consistent with what he went to get in our gospel. Um, one other thing, I'm sorry we didn't get into it, talking about this mind and heart with artificial intelligence. Because that's such an interesting subject right now because we, we're moving fast to artificial intelligence. But it's an intelligence that can only be rational. It has no heart. And you wonder what that would mean. And I, I saw an expert on say, well, I mean, nothing will be able to keep up with your thing, except for not a knock. But I, I don't know. And then some say, oh, we're even beginning to create artificial e emotion. That can react and help. What do y'all think about that? Are we on a good path here? It gets a little frightening to me. I, I understand the benefits. There are benefits, but I think it's like so many things, um, they can go awry. Um, yeah, I think that would be like fake, Facebook. There's some good things about it, but the social media aspect of it, I, I don't know, I don't know if we're, <laughs> we're beginning to how much we get in there, because we lost a lot too. 
Of course, that could sound, but that's the problem with what it says. Is if you put something on a platform, you're liable for it, just like a newspaper or a TV station is liable if you put out something that's not good. But uh, they took that out, and the Democrats, my party, uh, didn't put that in that the original communications bill. That would have solved a lot of problems, and it wouldn't have hurt it heard all the good things that go on with Facebook. Is it too late to do that, John? It's not <laughs> too late. It really is. And and I I think the reason is we got the best government money can buy. <laughs> I mean it's it's really, I mean they did it for a good reason. Yeah. And, and and the the Democrats, Al Gore made a big deal about this. The Democrats said we want a platform that people can give their, put their opinions on without fear of reprisal or anything. We want people to really say what's on their minds. And that's what we got. And uh, it's, but in that one sentence, because there's only one sentence in there that says they can't be saved. <laughs> that's why I say it. You can go out on the street and do anything that you want to without being governed by the laws of the land. Yeah. That, that's a little chaotic. And when I think it's science is doing this with artificial intelligence, I, I thought Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., your father, you know, was a, a famous little human writer, <coughs> and he was Oliver Wendell Holmes, and he said, and, and being so unscientific, I love this. He said, science is that discipline which makes major contributions to minor needs. <laughs> <laughs> I take reference to that. <laughs> because if I went back in town, I couldn't even tell people how to, to make a, a, an internal combustion engine. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.